President-elect Donald Trump hasn't even been sworn in yet, and already there are any number of reasons to be concerned about what direction his administration could take this country. As a result of that, regular Americans, in particular progressives, are wondering how we can organize to stop Trump's uh, administration in its uh, most excessive uh, moves towards what they see as authoritarianism, a hard right-wing shift for the country. They want to know what we can do. And to help us figure out some ways to organize against Trump and his administration, we bring on uh, Andy Z, spokesman for New York City's Revolution Books and one of the organizers at RefuseFascism.org. That's uh, organizing a month of opposition to Trump, Pence, and their administration. Thank you for joining us, Andy. Thank you, John. So we're going to get to the election and uh, and after the election uh, soon. But first, if you can catch us up, uh, we know that you've been uh, involved in political activism for a long time, organizing. Uh, what's your background in that? Well, I had the uh, the, the fortune of uh, coming up in the uh, late 1960s and early 1970s, where there was a massive movement to uh, change the uh, the policy to, to to stop the war in Vietnam, to change the culture, and for the uh, liberation of black people. And, and in New York, there was a tremendous movement for the liberation of Puerto Rico as well. And, and this movement uh, influenced me greatly at that time. And we also had the fortune of seeing that this movement dealt, uh, gave rise to a crisis in the government. And we even saw a president and a vice president both forced to resign and ad administrations change. So for those of us who grew up in that era, the idea of being able to um, oust a regime through mass struggle is not uh, something completely foreign to our thinking. And now we face an extremely situ a serious situation, uh, more dire than almost anything we faced before with this new Trump and Pence regime, which is going to be and uh, a fascist regime, and that is something not to be uh, trifled with, and we need to stop it, and we need to stop it before it starts. Yeah, I try to put myself in the position of somebody engaged in, uh, in the movement back then. Imagine after decades of struggle, and in some areas progress, in other areas uh, either backsliding or, or nothing at all, stalling out, the idea that a, a billionaire like this, who so obviously wants to personally profit from America, so little opposition, both from the Democratic Party and now during the, the nomination hearings, the idea that he would be able to so easily waltz in and basically write the script for what's going to happen in America after what I find uh, personally distressing. Uh, now, one uh, uh, group that you're involved in, Revolution Books, uh, I love the, the tagline for this, the claims to be the, the political, intellectual, and cultural center of a movement for an actual revolution. So uh, tell us more about uh, Revolution Books. What is that all about? Well, that is what the mission of the store is. It's a bookstore that people come to from all around the world. It's a place where they, people can come to find the books and the engagement with why the world is the hard is for the majority of humanity, why the planet itself is in peril. And they can also discover the, uh, a solution to that and, and get into that. And undergirding the store is the is a new communism, a new synthesis of communism developed by the revolutionary leader Bob Avakian, which at its heart is a more scientific way of understanding the world, understanding where do the problems come from, what are their root causes, what is the political system we live under, how could it be transformed, what would a new society be, what would a strategy for that new society be. And a big part of this uh, scientific methodology requires and involves engaging a wide birth of ideas. And so Revolution Books has the uh, novels, the poetry, the, uh, the theatrical, the plays, the art, it, and it also has the history, sociology, uh, that enable people to understand the past, uh, be able to imagine the present and imagine the future. And so all of this uh, creates a very, very vital mix there. And then faced with this situation of the Trump presidency, the day after the election, we decided, well, we really got to talk about fascism here, because that's who this guy is, Trump. And he's formed an alliance with uh, what has been a developing stream in America, a Christian fascist stream that's been uh, developing for the last, last 35 years in his alliance with Pence and the people around him. And uh, as it's turned out to how that intersects then with the, this Christian fascism all up in the military. And so we uh, then started on 65 days of defiant programming at the bookstore. But that was insufficient when we really came to grips with what a Trump regime would mean. And so then we got together, some of us with other people, and formed RefuseFascism.org as an organization that was going to do everything we could to bring about really mass struggle to be able to create the kind of political crisis in this country where those 
all the different factions of those in power would prevent this regime from coming to power. Now, that's not the revolution, but it's a stage of the revolution in the sense that should they come to power and really wield all the instruments of this country, it's going to be a very, very difficult time for people to uh, to protest, have civil society, even dialogue. And you can just study other societies like this and see uh, what what is potentially on the table, or even look at the press conference just the other day. Yeah, exactly. Now, you you reference other people who are involved in the, the creation of uh, of resist fa of refuse fascism. Uh, who else is involved in that organization? Well, we published an ad uh, in the. Uh, in the New York Times, and then uh, this past uh, week in the Washington Post on on Wednesday, and you can see some of the um, more w um, nationally and internationally known uh, people who are signatories. And then there is over six thousand more people who've signed on to it. And there's groups uh, in different cities that have come together. Some of the signatories include um, Chuck D. Uh, that includes. Uh, 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 actors. It includes Ed Asner. It includes prominent scientists like Niles Eldridge and P.Z. Myers, uh, graphic designers, uh, people involved in uh, political work, uh, uh, Cornell West, uh, uh, and, and myself. And Carl Dix is at sort of at the at the heart of this movement. Carl Dix is is, is a spokesperson for the Revolutionary Communist Party. He's part of this movement, very key in in, in starting it. People from the women's movement, different struggles. So. It's really ad hoc, and in three and a half weeks, we've been trying to uh, create the kind of movement that could really create the kind of crisis by taking to the streets, by protesting day after day in ways that bring D.C. in particular to a halt so that there is the kind of political crisis from below. Because as you said, John, the Democratic Party is going to go along with this. There might be some protests here and there, uh, petty amendments raised to things, but essentially they're saying we're going to work with them. You can't work with fascists. You can't accommodate fascists. That's not what they're doing. So and it's that serious. I do want to turn to the, the organizing and what people can actually do. Uh, but before that, uh, the core concept that we're talking about here is, is fascism. And as you alluded to, there are many different uh, definitions for fascism. I come up through political science, and so I know that people have tried to get uh, a hold of what fascism looks like in different times, in different places. You alluded to Christian fascism. Uh, American fascism might look different from, you know, old school German fascism. So when you use the term, when your organization talks about fascism in the American context, uh, how do you define that? A good question. Um, well, one thing we say in the call that was published in the New York Times is that by any definition, in every definition of fascism, Trump passes the test. <laughs> any definition you look at, he 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 uh, corresponds to that. But what we put in the ad is the that what we think is the essential element of fascism is that it, it is that it uses it forments and uses violence, both extra state violence and also the violence of the state to intimidate opponents and to essentially strip away the kind of democratic rights, if you will, that at least a, a section of the people enjoy in a country at this at this time. Of course, as we know, there's many people who don't have very many rights, people being shot down by the police all the time, mass incarceration, uh, a million and a half people uh, deported under Obama. But still, what's essential about fascism is that it's a change in the form of rule through which uh, the ruling uh, elites rule. And, uh, and it's such that it makes it extremely difficult to have uh, the kind of uh, society where even dissent is, is possible without, uh, you know, very serious consequences. And so throughout so that the- is what we feel is the essence of it. Uh, so throughout the Republican primary and into the general election, uh, I remember along the way us covering speeches, uh, the debates, primaries, and uh, we identified uh, along the way many instances where we felt like Trump was moving in that direction, uh, calling on his supporters to violently attack uh, protesters, demonizing entire classes of people, talking about bans for religions and things of that sort. Um, but what for you, what, what was it that started to concern you about Trump early on that made you think that he might not be a typical Republican politician, that he might be uh, something different, something perhaps from a different uh, historical era? Yeah, well, John, you're right. All the things you just described are part of what uh, a, a fascist says. It's, it's that xenophobic nationalism. It's the misogyny. I mean, this this guy's world class in, in that category. Uh, the racism, the demonization of other cultures, the uh, bellicose militarism. 
And look, then it gets very sharp. He led a convention that was uh, a, a rally demanding that his opponent, that his opponent be jailed. And there's he's in his victory lap after the election. He's still going around had, with, with rallies where people are saying, lock her up, lock her up, and then even insinuated that people, uh, Second Amendment people should take care of her. So that gives you some indication of where he's coming from. Now, it wasn't completely a surprise. We live, I live in New York City, and we know that in the early, that first of all, he has a long history of this, but in the early 1990s, when yeah. a group of young black men were uh, falsely arrested for the rape of a woman, or a, hor a horrific rape of a woman, uh, to which they were eventually uh, uh, exonerated, Donald Trump took out full pages ads in all the newspapers here and called for the uh, death penalty for them. And now, even after they've been exonerated, even after uh, another ev witness has come forward, corroborated by DNA evidence, he still says that they're guilty. So you know right there, you got yourself a, a very serious uh, problem of somebody who has no uh, regard for the truth, but does have the intention and the capability of um, causing tremendous harm to whole sections of the people. And now, just imagine him running the state. And you can see what he's done. He's appointed a, a, a somebody, uh, Jeff Sessions, to be head attorney general, who has not only no regard for civil rights, but actually has a tremendous hatred for black and Latino people, and uh, will enforce that with all the powers of the state. So this is not something that to be trifled with, which is why we are very seriously calling on people to not just register their disapproval and do symbolic protest, but to really come down and do everything we can to try to stop this. Uh, the time is short when this might be possible, but we have to take that time and do what's necessary to stop what will clearly be a catastrophe, not just for people in this country, but for the people of the world. Remember, he has his hand on the nuclear button, and over Christmas, he couldn't contain himself to saying he wants to start a new nuclear arms race. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you brought up the, uh, the locker up chants and uh, how they, they really yeah. created like what I would have been happier if it was a two minute hate, but a week long hate against Hillary Clinton as this unique demon figure. Um, and then it seemed like after he won the election, he had sort of forgotten about that and moved on. And yet just this morning, he began tweeting once again. She was very guilty. She should have never been allowed to run. Now, I don't know if that's a reflection of what he genuinely believes or, or more likely when he's under, he feels under attack, he tries to divert attention to locking up political opposition figures. And uh, which, whichever it is, if it's his true belief or if it's just a political tactic of his, that's scary uh, going forward. And it's unfortunate that, that some on uh, what I consider to be my side of the political spectrum are not, they're, they're not bothered by that because we also have problems with Hillary Clinton. They're all too willing to go along with it, not realizing that, that Trump is not on our side in how he, uh, he goes after Democratic politicians. Um, hey, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, what were you going to say? I, just think you made a very, I think you made a very important point. Look, how we got here, there's a whole process to getting here, uh, and including the normalization of all kinds of measures over decades. And, uh, you know, and, and Hillary Clinton herself, this is the things he's complaining about are not the worst of it. But the fact is people, the, the kinds of measures that both parties represent have been very normalized over a long period of time. And the Democratic Party itself, even now, after his election, uh, Don, uh, President Obama said, well, this is just uh, an intramural struggle. We're all on the same team. Hmm. No, we're not all on the same team. And those who really see that have a more radical analysis, like yourself, who see that the problem is in both parties, or at myself, we see it's the system itself that underlies us, that's the problem. We have to recognize what it means for this to come to power and how to actually d deal with this uh, and, and the need to, to stop it. And, and then you see there's Bernie Sanders out there saying, well, we'll work with him where we can work with him. No, you don't work with fascists. I mean, this is akin to saying we can work with them on infrastructure, which the whole Democratic Party is saying. We'll work with them on infrastructure. What? On building the, the, the railroads to the death camps? Now, it's, yes, it's not Nazi Germany. As Carl Dick said on the Bill O'Reilly show, uh, Donald Trump doesn't have a little black uh, mustache. He's got an orange squirrel on his head. But OK, <laughs> it's not exactly the same. Fascism's going to come in America wrapped in the flag, wrapped in the Bible, wrapped in, in a whole different package. But what's more ominous in America is that this is the most powerful country in the history of humanity with nuclear weapons up the wazoo, 
military bases all around the world. And now it's in the hands not only of a psychopath, but of people who have um, uh, uh, their hands, uh, a whole array of people who have uh, very reactionary and fascistic views. And as a cabal, they're going to create great, great havoc for humanity. And this is what we're trying to prevent. And it's not okay to just celebrate whatever gains people may think we've made in the last eight years and not get out there and put everything on the line now. It is not easier to fight a regime like this after they come to power. It can be uh, immeasurably more difficult. Yeah, and I, look, I think when, you, uh, when we talk about camps, some people, like, they freak out and they say that's not fair. And maybe I'm naive. I don't expect that anytime soon we're going to have death camps or death uh, gas chambers or anything like that. But don't forget that after he talked about banning Muslims from coming in, they also immediately began talking about possible camps for Muslims, and he was supported by some Republican politicians uh, when they spoke about that. Thankfully, some of that rhetoric has fallen off, but it could return if he feels uh, under pressure at some point. Uh, I do want to turn to what people can do, though. So you're getting ready for a, a massive, uh, I believe it's a month long, uh, before the, the uh, uh, inauguration has started and going on for after it, daily and nightly protests. So uh, tell us about that. What's your goal? How can people get involved in that? Sure. I mean, we're coming to the end of that month now. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so there's really just uh, a week, uh, uh, one week till the inauguration. So now is the time. We're calling, we're going to start on uh, Saturday at four o'clock in McPherson Park in Washington, D.C., as well as in other cities for people who can't get to Washington. And what we're going to do is be marching through the night. We're asking people to bring their signs, to bring uh, uh, flashlights, to bring lights, to, to get out into the streets. And these, whoever comes that night, whether it's hundreds or thousands, needs to start marching and they need to start resisting and, and, and calling on people, going through neighborhoods, calling on people that this actually has to be stopped. And then on Sunday, going out to the, to the churches, to the celebrations of MLK K Day and be talking with people there about we have to take to the streets. And then again, Sunday night, same thing on Monday. By Tuesday, we are, our hope and what we think is necessary to happen is tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people should take to the streets of Washington and bring the city to a halt and create the kind of political crisis that would loosen some things up for those people who actually are in power at this point who have great disagreements and perhaps real trepidation and fears of this regime to go find the reasons to oppose this and to stall this inauguration. Is that a long shot? Yes, it is. Is it necessary? Absolutely. Could it happen? Yes, it could. It's a long shot, but it is actually the only and the best shot that the people have to prevent something that will truly bring a horror to humanity. So uh, I always question uh, myself on my beliefs. I assume that I can be wrong. Let's say that, um, that, that you're incorrect about, about Trump. Let's hy hypothesize that, that I'm incorrect and that he is not going to move the country uh, in the direction that we fear he might. In four years, what could the country look like to reassure you that he was not going to convert us over into a fascism, that, that, that he had either been stopped by movements like yours or others, uh, or had never actually intended it in the first place. What, what could you see that would reassure you in four years? Well, uh, a couple of things. One is, um, I don't think we're going to see that reassurance from him. And understand that a fascist mentality, a fascist regime doesn't mean that day one, they're putting on jack boots and, and, and marching down the street in goose steps, and there's death camps right away. If you even study uh, one of the most extreme and known uh, histories of fascism in, in Nazi Germany, it was a process that took place over a long period of time. In fact, after Hitler, uh, after the Nazis won the uh, 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 majority of seats or a large minority in the, Sen in the Reichstag, you know, there was a period of time when he was in a coalition, he would speak nicely, but other people would do the dirty work. But then you see, here's what happens. Crises develop. How is Donald Trump going to end that, you know, what one columnist, I think, of the New York Times wrote, the cabinet of ghouls, hmm. legion of do ghouls, what legion of doom, what, what are they going to do when faced with a crisis? 
So these are the kinds of things we're looking at. I don't think there's anything he's going to do. That I don't. I, I just think it's 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 obvious what these people have done and will do. Look, we have a situation where abortion is extremely hard for a woman to uh, obtain in this country already. With this regime in power for four years, I think we're going to have an underground railroad just to get women basic health care to have control of their lives. So this is the situation. Now, I'm not trying to predict what's going to happen in four years. I just think for those people who want to wait and see what he does, that's a that historically, whether you're talking, look, there's people who were waiting in Turkey to see what Erdogan was going to do. Yeah. And now you've seen it. It's not advisable to wait for to find out what people who say they're going to do what they say they're going to do, who have track records, whether it's DeVos in Detroit and with the Republican Party and the, and the reactionary organization she funds or with Jeff Sessions or any of these other people, they have a proven track, track record, including National Security Advisor uh, Bannon at the, uh, as yeah. a strategic advisor to the president, just a straight up fascist. The media's got to stop with this all right stuff. And John, you can see this in this press conference. Every reporter in that room, when he when he denounced CNN, of which I am not a lover of, every reporter in that room should have repeated that question. And then when they shut that reporter down, and and they were threatened him to leave, they all should have walked out. I if agree. If that had happened, we'd be in a different place. But see, already people are more concerned with having their access to this than actually standing up to it. Yeah. We have a terrible culture here where people are not used to the kind of resistance that's required to bring about. A better world. Yeah, I can say that I would love the day that uh, Trump walks out to his podium for a press conference and there's no one in the room, except for his paid staffers who are there to clap for him. Uh, and, and I'm yeah. certainly not advocating for people uh, standing by and watching. I hope that they get involved. Uh, if they do want to find out more about your organization and the events that you're organizing, uh, where can they find that information? They can find that out at refusefascism.org. Uh, uh, there is uh, both what's happening in Washington, which is our central focus, but there's also protests in every city, different kinds of events here in New York City. On uh, a week from tonight, there's uh, Musicians Against Fascism, an incredible concert that's going to take place to benefit Refuse Fascism at Symphony Space. There's other things happening around the country. People can go to that website and they can find phone numbers, ways to hook up. But most of all, People need to understand this is a group of people that have come together in just a few weeks to do what may seem to be the impossible. But there's times in history when the impossible is possible because of the extremeness of the situation. This is one of those times. So kind of it's got to be a caravan to Washington, kind of like when people went to Woodstock back in the day, where people find one way or another to get to Washington and say, I do not want to live in a fascist America. In the name of humanity, we must put a stop to this. And that's what's going to create a different ethos, a different fighting spirit, and we have a shot. I believe we still have a shot at preventing this inauguration from happening. And certainly would put us in the best position moving forward. But I think we have to stop this now. If we don't stop it now, then I don't want to be thinking about what it's going to be like in a year, what it's going to be like uh, uh, you know, in, in 18 months. Uh, now is the time. This is, this is, people should know enough to be able to say, I'm not going to stand with this. Okay, Andy Z of uh, New York City's Revolution Books and RefuseFascism.org. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, John. Good questions. Thank you. Okay, and thank you for watching uh, this interview. If you're not already, you can subscribe to YouTube.com slash TYT interviews to see more uh, conversations with uh, activists, actors, politicians, and more. Thanks for joining us.